Welcome back to Red Cedar Radar. Um, I am here with my, as promised, preview episode for Michigan State's matchup against Maryland. I'm joined by Pat Donahue. Um, He is a current Maryland football analyst who writes for a couple sites, um, the Rivals version of Spartans Illustrated, Terrapin Sports Report, and um, another site, Baltimore Sports and Life. How are you today, Pat? I'm doing good. How are you, Sydney? I am doing well. Thanks so much for joining. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, of um, course. Before we get talking too much about Maryland and the game, tell me a little bit about your history with Maryland football and kind of what you do as an analyst. Yeah, so um, I actually ended up going to uh, Maryland for grad school for journalism um, many moons ago, and then um, that kind of led to me meeting the uh, publisher of the Rivals site and starting to work with them. Um, so I've basically been around and covering the team since about 2012. Um, used to be on the Daily Beat there every day at practice for football and basketball and doing all sorts of um, coverage that way. Um, these days, it's I'm a little more hands-off and do a little bit more analytical stuff on a freelance basis, kind of more of, I guess, a columnist role you could say a, you know a young a young columnist you could say um but uh yeah no that's uh it, it's been fun covering them for you know over a decade and kind of seeing some ups and downs a transition from the ACC to the Big 10 that was that all happened in my second or third year covering the team so i've gotten to see a lot many head coaches many players and uh two conferences so it's been fun yeah that is fun um you probably get this as well. Um, speaking of ups and downs, we're kind of going through some downs right now at Michigan State. Um, so it's interesting to hear that perspective that you've stuck with it so long, even yeah. through kind of some tumultuous times. So I yeah, like I mean, you got to be loyal, right? And you got to right. this is because not only is it, um, you know, this, the the beat that I covered for many years, but it, it's a, I'm an alumni. Um, so right. I have a um, you know, a special place for Maryland in my heart and kind of what well, was nice about writing for rivals and some of the other um, websites and, and publications that I've covered Maryland for is they, um, you know, they don't ask me to hide that they're not looking for necessarily, you know, objectivity per se, I try to be as objective as I can. And anyone who knows me and has followed my coverage knows I'm probably one of the harsher critics um, of the teams I cover. So um, no problem for me there. But it, um, yeah, it certainly is a, um, uh, I think it, it, it says something to, you know, kind of be able to cover a team that is uh, only going to win three games. Or, you know, it's easy to cover a winning winning team. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it says something to be able to stick with those losers. <laughs> Not to say it like that, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving into kind of where Maryland has already been this season, um, they have had kind of some crazy games. I caught a little bit of their most recent one on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming into the game with a 3-0 record. So came out with the wins in the end, but things were a little shaky. Went down, I think, in all the games by double digits at first. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, I can't remember if they went down to Towson in the first game by double digits or not. Okay. Um, but I know they got off to a slow start either way. It wasn't like they, you know, they weren't blowing a... Uh, inferior team out, out of the water yeah. there um but yes yeah, certainly the last two games down double digits early very scary stuff because those were um also inferior opponents that maryland was supposed to have no problem with um you know double digit uh favorites both times uh on the on the money line and spread so um yeah i mean that was definitely alarming to see that be a continuing trend for this team you definitely don't want to see that but we were talking about this on the podcast I do um, for Baltimore Sports and Life um, on Monday that it's kind of a catch-22 because you never want to see your team start that way. But things can snowball very quickly in football when you get off to slow starts. And to see them overcome that not once but twice shows, you know, really shows that this team has some um, resiliency that, uh, you know, will stick hopefully through the season. Um but yeah, I'm really interested to see as the competition ramps up here, if they can actually, you know, get started faster and, um, you know, build some momentum early as opposed to having to claw back. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about why they started so slow? Was it the same thing both times or was it just kind of different things each game? 
Yeah, so in the um, last game against Virginia, it was, um, and I want to make sure I'm not conflating the two. Let me bring up the box score real quick just to make sure I'm not conflating the two um, outcomes here. But I believe it was the Virginia game, the last one, that uh, Talia Tagovailoa, um, our quarterback, he started off with a um, interception early, and that kind of um, – yeah, so sorry, I think I'm getting it conflated here. Um, okay. It was the Charlotte game that he started off by throwing a uh, pick six, and that was kind of very uncharacteristic of him. He, you know, takes care of the ball, and that kind of rattled the team there. Um, but to answer your questions, it's kind of been like weird stuff. It's been it's been big plays. Um, the the Virginia game, it was a a breakdown in coverage. We had a safety out, so it was a breakdown in coverage on the first drive that led to a big passing play. Um, so kind of just like freak things like that, like turnovers that led to scores or breakdowns in coverage. But they didn't do that the rest of, rest of those games. They like very quickly made adjustments, and Talia went on to have good games both times. Um, from there on out. So like I said, he's not typically a turnover machine. I think it was kind of a, a shock to the system for everyone when that happened, but then to be able to regroup from that um, both times, you know, was why they were able to come away with two victories. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I was curious if it was something that wasn't being fixed over and over that was kind of like a recurring problem or if it was like fluke things, like you said. So I think it's just general like sloppiness and the bidding coming out a little flat yeah. uh, sloppiness in general, with like penalties. That's been a common theme with this team, not only this season, but uh, in recent years, um, they're just one of the most penalized teams, not only in the conference, but in the country. Um, so I think they just come out a little, I don't want to say unprepared that, sounds a little harsh but they just come out a little flat and a little um sloppy early um yeah. and that leads to some of those big plays and some of those turnovers um but yeah i mean i think that um you know if they can come out a little more focused that it's something that they can fix yeah absolutely okay anything else of note from those first three games that you think will carry over into their matchup against michigan state we're going to talk quarterback and kind of offense defense but anything else specific yeah, I mean, I think in all three games, they've done a really good job at um, stopping the run. The pass has been a different story. They haven't been as uh, good at, at that. And I'll, I guess, touch on that later when we get into the matchup here. But um, yeah, I think the run defense has been consistent and will hopefully carry over. And the um, backfield has turned into a bit of a committee. Um, Roman Henby was kind of expected to be our lead back. He's our leading rusher and was last year as well. And I would still say he's probably our best and most versatile rusher. Um, but our best runner the last two games, at least based off of stats and by the eye test, has been Colby McDonald, um, who's also fairly talented. And then we have Antoine Littleton, who's a who's a power back and uh, a big body former um, linebacker. So he, uh, you know, they, they, they have a nice complement of uh, skill sets there in the backfield, but no one even, you know, from a um, people who cover the team standpoint expected it to be this much of a committee um, early on. So, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if they continue to go with that three back approach. Okay, good to know. I think um, moving into the quarterback, I have some questions specifically. Um, it's Tug of Viola, right? I want to make sure I'm uh, saying yeah, it right. Yeah, Tago, Tago, Talia Tag of Viola. Tag of Iowa. Yep. <laughs> okay. It's not I practiced it beforehand. I, I watched a bunch of videos and I practiced and I just messed it up, but that's okay. Well, you'll hear, you'll hear it pronounced a million different ways by different people. Um, yeah. I mean, I could be slightly pronouncing it wrong, but no one's corrected me yet. So. Okay. So he's had some decent games. I mean, thrown five touchdowns, um, one rushing score in the last game. Um, and then so Barnett, our acting head coach right now, um, our interim, whatever the whatever the title is currently, uh, he put some notes out there that, you know, um, that's something that he's a little bit worried about for this matchup, that he thinks that Maryland's quarterback can pretty much throw the ball from anywhere, um, and that he likes to move around in the pocket a lot. And do you have any points on that about this mass up, matchup specifically and how you think – his skills will compare to MSU's defense. Yeah, um, 
I like this matchup for Talia. I really do. Um, he is your, your coach was spot on. I think one of his best skill sets is his ability to throw on the run. Um, not only, you know, the ability to move him out of the pocket, roll him out and, you know, where he can get his feet set, but also when his feet are, isn't set, he can, he really can't throw the ball from anywhere and kind of any position. Um, he, like I said, he's not a turn. He's, he's, proven you know throughout his career to not really be a turnover machine he has his moments he's had some games where he's unraveled in the past but like i said in the charlotte game he threw that pick early and then he got himself together and had a really good game after that last week he looked great so i don't worry about him too much there his ability to to keep his mobility but he's not a run first player like he he's a mobile quarterback who can take off if he needs to but he's always looking downfield i think is his biggest asset and kind of what coach barnett's talking about here um so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely takes defensive backs to be very disciplined um, to not get, you know, to not get drawn up by Tolia, Tolia's legs and then, you know, get beat over the top. So that'll be definitely something to watch in this game. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be I'm very curious to see if they're able to handle that or not. If Barnett is already taking notes, it makes me a little nervous that they might not be able to handle it, but we'll just see. Um, OK, you will. Moving on, I guess, talk to me about, you already mentioned some names that people should watch out for. Um, any other key names that you think will make big plays or make an appearance um, on Saturday that Michigan State fans should know about, offense or defense? Yeah, for sure. Um, so on offense, um, I mean, I already mentioned some of the running backs names. Um, you know, I do think I'm waiting for a Roman Hemby breakout game. So he's the one who I mentioned, who's not necessarily off to a hot start, but he's the leading rusher from last year, you know, presumably the most talented back. And we're kind of waiting for him to have one big performance. Um, but looking at how these teams match up, at least initially, it looks like this could be a, an aerial attack by both teams really um so our receivers uh have really kind of split themselves into tiers there's three guys well two receivers and a tight end who have kind of emerged as our three biggest pass catching threats um Caden Prather who's a uh, transfer this is his first year at Maryland he's been kind of our field stretcher and burner and he's been making some big plays and then Jashawn Jones who's been here for several years uh I think he's a fifth year senior at this point but he um very versatile and he can run the entire route tree you can even run him on jet sweeps things like that some people remember from three or four years ago when he opening game and uh, against texas in austin he ran for a touchdown threw a touchdown and caught a touchdown so he's that's kind of his uh call to fame there um and then our tight end Corey deitches is uh really having himself a great year and he's more that big body and that red zone threat um so those are all names to watch on offense on defense uh Ja'Shawn Barham is our best pass rusher he um is coming off a great freshman year last year and has picked up where he left off this year um Donnell Brown he's another transfer we Maryland's done very well under this current coaching re regime in the transfer market and because we get uh, we lose a lot of guys to the transfer portal every year, but we bring guys in as well. So um, Donnell Brown Brown is another one. He's a defensive lineman, edge rusher, who also um, has interceptions in back-to-back -back weeks. So he's shown like some versatility there, um, being able to deflect passes and and you know just kind of make heads up plays. Um, so yeah, those are just some of the guys that are currently making the big plays. I, I'll also mention since he had two interceptions last week and he'll probably play a big role in this game in the secondary. Uh, Tarheeb's still our best cornerback. Um, he's going to have a tall task against your guys' receivers for sure. Okay, yeah, those are great. Thank you. That was perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a question that popped in my mind that isn't really on our sheet or, you know, pre sheet here. I want to know, and you may not have an opinion on this, but what – from someone else outside of Michigan State, and also but also still in the Big Ten, what are your opinions about the state of Michigan State's team right now and, like, all the drama that has happened? Does that – obviously, it will weigh on your prediction because it is going to weigh on our team, and it did weigh on our team last week, I think. Um, what is How does that factor into your prediction, and kind of what are your thoughts on that at all? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting for me to hear you say that you think it uh, weighed on your team last week because um, I didn't you know. I mean, I trust your opinion on that. You're closer to the situation than I am. And I was because I was wondering that same thing when I saw I mean, Washington's a very good team. So I wondered, was that a result of just a talent gap um, or is it or was this starting to affect your players? Um because part of me feels like Maryland wouldn't have done much better against Washington. Like they're that Washington's that good of a team. Um, but that's kind of what I've been going back and forth, back and forth on all week when it comes to making a prediction, you never know when a team, especially when it comes to college players, uh, you know, emotion can really take over a lot of times. Is that going to be a negative or a positive? Are they going to rally behind it and play harder for each other or, is it chaotic over there in terms of coaches and stuff? And that's going to throw things off because uh, football players very much are regimented as well. So um, I could really see the emotions of it all and, and all the off the field stuff that's happening, affecting the team either way. Um, but my gut tells me it probably isn't helping. I don't know. It, I think you would need a really special leader in terms of like a quarterback or someone on the team, a really strong core of players. And I knew you guys have some core players, but a lot of guys who have just gotten in there from the transfer portal and some other key guys are injured. So I don't know how strong that core is. And uh, I don't know, I lean towards it probably hurting the performance rather than helping. But I'm, if you're a Maryland coach, you cannot be, you know, letting these guys think that that will be happening and let them take this uh, team lightly because Maryland is not in a position to take any Big Ten team lightly. Yeah, I want to circle back to what you said. I do think, I mean, the talent at Washington matters, and I don't want to discount that. I think maybe, and I said this in the last episode of the pod, so if anyone's you know a recurring listener, um, I think they were unprepared and they were going to be unprepared no matter what. And then, you know, the whole drama of everything on top of it just didn't help that. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe it would have been a little bit of a closer game. I still think Washington would have come away with it, Um, but it wouldn't have been as bad of a train wreck as it was without everything else that's happened. So I'm just key. I'm really curious to know how they will bounce back after that, you know, after being unprepared and then the drama of everything and then, losing so badly at home against Washington, I'm going to be really curious to see what the spin on this is. Is this going to be a spiral where it just keeps going down and down and down? Or is it going to be like, okay, time to rally. You know, we got our butts handed to us once. We're not going to let it happen again. Yeah. There's that aspect too. And you get kind of upstaged like that a little bit. There's that rallying cry. It also, I think it helps that you guys are at home. I mean, uh, when things aren't going great, you can't ask for better situation than to be at home and not have to travel and deal with all those logistics. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, Maryland better be prepared. I'm expecting points. That's the only prediction I can make is that this is looking like it might be a shootout. Yeah, that was going to be my next question for you. Do you have any concrete predictions? That that's the one is that I, I think there are going to be points scored. Um, at least last I checked on Monday when we were doing the podcast, we checked to see what the weather was going to be like, and it was looking perfect, like seventy five mm-hmm. and sunny or something like that. So, if that holds up, I love it. Um, if that changes and it's crappy weather, forget you ever listened to me because that throws all <laughs> that out the window. A Big Ten game in crappy weather is probably going to be like a 10-9 score or something like that. So, um, but no, I really, I think this game has a chance to get into the 30s and 40s for either team or both teams um, where I could see a scenario where it's a total shootout and it's last team to get the ball wins. I could really see that. Or, you know, if Michigan State is really just not, does not have it yet, I could see Maryland. I, I think Maryland's going to be able to put up points. So I could see Maryland cover the majority of the, uh, the uh, projected point total. So yeah, yeah, get, get a, get your popcorn ready for some scoring <laughs> and it's a seven and a half point spread right now. So, um, you know, that, that shootout last team to score prediction could hold true. Yeah, I agree. Okay. To kind of wrap up our discussion here, um, Tell me a little bit about how you think the rest of the season for Maryland will go and your prediction as things move forward. Yeah. Uh, well, in all these years covering Maryland, um, every year, at least every semi-successful year, every year that hasn't been a total disaster, um, there's been a few of those, um, 
has kind of been a, a carbon copy of itself where really front load these non-conference wins that we're supposed to, um, which is good. Got to win those games where you get three to four wins right there towards the bowl um, minimum. And then it's survive and advance in the Big Ten play where, you know, usually beat Rutgers or we've kind of gone back and forth with them a little bit, but we can usually count on beating them. Uh, you know, Nebraska has been pretty bad. So we've beaten them usually when we've played them uh, Illinois, like, you know, Northwestern Illinois, there's these teams that we can usually compete with or get. Um, and then we just, we do not fare well against outside of like one win against Penn state years ago, we do not fare well against the blue bloods. And that's, that's the next step that we're, trying to take. And last year after an eight win season, we won a bowl game. We have a Maryland searched forever for a quarterback. I mean, when I first started covering the team, they literally had a linebacker playing quarterback because that's how many injuries they had. And it was, it was horrendous to watch. And um, they just haven't had a ton of quarterback success in that school's history. And uh, Talia is just a, uh, a breath of fresh air and has been now for three, four years of, as a starter, just being, um, a playmaker and someone that, yeah, he's had a couple bad games here and there, not a ton, but he just is someone who's fun to watch and, and can move the ball. So he gives this fan base hope that eight wins is now hopefully like the standard and like the floor. And we're hoping, you know, or seven, eight wins. And then we're hoping to get to that nine, 10, if we can pull off a blue blood win. Um, I know people would love to see that happen this year. If we could, um, you know, we play at Ohio State, obviously tough task. We do get Michigan at home. They're two of the best teams in the country um, right now. What I've seen from Maryland so far this year, I don't necessarily know or think that they are better than last year's team simply because of the trenches. They lost a lot of talent in the trenches on both sides of the ball. Sides of the ball. Um, and that might be the biggest difference. That's not a great um, recipe for success in the Big Ten. So, um I still think they're a bowl team. I still think six, seven, possibly eight wins. But I, I do think it it, it stinks because it's the last year with Talia, and I know fans really want him to get that marquee win, and I'm not ruling it out. A lot can happen, especially we got Michigan the last uh, game of the season at home. Who knows what state of you know injuries happen, things like that. We do get Penn State at home too. Um, but it's hard for me to predict those to be Maryland wins right now. So – yeah, probably seven or eight wins is what I'm guessing. And we call these uh, games against you know Michigan State and we got Indiana next week. Uh, we call them the swing games because they really are um, as important to a team like Maryland as any other game. We have to absolutely win those games to even think about uh, a bowl game in a successful season. So, yeah, I think I think at the end of it, we're going to we're going to feel good about it and hopefully at least take one of these blue bloods right down to the wire. All right. You know, personally, I hope that it's Michigan and not because hey. I'm biased or anything, but you know, that's just, that's just that my thought. Would, I would love to see Harbaugh and his khakis just, you know, <laughs> waddle off the field and, <laughs> and, and have a frown on his face. That would mm -hmm, be excellent. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Hey, what if we play playoff spoiler for them? What if they're right there at the end? And that'd be crazy. Yeah. We would love nothing more than that in Maryland. And that would be the icing on the cake for, uh, to Leah's career and yeah. he would probably get carried off the field like Rudy. Uh, and then we would go to Rutgers the next week and lose in a rainy game. Into mm. or something. That, that's Maryland football. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it goes. Usually. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> yeah. If that happens, if you beat Michigan, if, if Maryland beats Michigan, I'll have you back on the pod and we can just talk crap about Jim Harbaugh the whole time. That'll be great. We'll pop a <laughs> bottle and uh, have, yeah. ha have a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's all my questions. I think that's a really good preview um, looking ahead to Saturday. Let me tell you. Um, uh, Michigan State will play Maryland at 3.30. I was looking up the time on yep. Saturday. Um, I'll be in the press box, so I'll have the recap episode for all of the listeners with um, Brendan and some of the other guys from the press box out after the game. Um Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining, Pat. It's been great. It's been um, my pleasure. Find this podcast anywhere that you listen and on YouTube. Subscribe to Spartans Illustrated if you want more football coverage. Uh, we're pretty much pumping out things at all times of day right now during football season. So check us out. There's a promo code that I'm going to be putting in the description. Um, and I also be, will be tagging Pat in the description. So give him a follow also if you want to know more about Maryland football. 
Thanks so much. And I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.